Hi everyone, Zach here, and welcome to the prep video for lesson 34 in this series on developing a survival game. In this prep video, we will be talking about textures and texture optimization. This video and this series have been brought to you by my Patreon sponsors. Now before we get into the prep video, I would just like to give a quick, albeit anonymous shout out to community members who work in the industry, who work in art and 3D asset work, who helped me put together the prep videos for this section. Now that I've gone through the introduction, what will we be doing in the tutorial itself? Well, we'll be setting up our landscape material and we'll be creating our first rock material layer using material functions. We'll come back to that in the next prep video. As I said, for this prep video, we're going to focus on textures. Probably the best place to start is, what is a texture? A texture, or textures, are images. Simply put, they're just images. Now, of course, we can do different things with them. We could use the standard image, like we will in this section, where the image is just one thing. It's the albedo for a material. It's the normal for our material. Alternatively, we could use atlases or layer blends where each RGB layer is actually a different image and we do different things based on what part of the image we're pulling from. In fact, you can use that to update our clouds in section five. We don't because I lack the technical ability to make a good atlas or to make a good uh, compressed material where we're using each of those channels. It, sorry, it's called a compressed material or compressed texture, not a layer blend. That's a term that I'm thinking about because we're gonna be talking about layer blending materials in the next prep video. And textures take up space in memory when the game loads in or the renderer loads in the texture or the material takes up space there. It also takes up physical space on the hard drive. In fact, for both, these textures can be among the largest in memory and in storage. In fact, for storage, there are some projects where I cannot commit the texture files due to their sheer size. And engines or renderers have memory pools for texture streaming. You might have seen over budget in other projects, that's what that's on about. You have a certain amount in memory that's reserved for textures and materials to be rendered in or streamed in. And we will be updating our memory pool in a later video. I believe, and I could be wrong about this, that it's video 52 in this series. All right, let's talk about texture streaming more in detail. So texture streaming is literally just loading in and out of textures. That's all it is. Is a texture in memory? Is it out of memory? So are we streaming it in? Are we loading it into memory or not? If the pool is full, so for example, too many large textures loaded in at once, or a lot of small textures that add up to several large textures, which is a thing you can do, by the way, the engine or renderer will no longer be able to load in higher resolution textures. So this might result in images being blurry. In fact, they're not really blurry. What we're seeing up close is a lower resolution version of the image that is meant to be viewed at a distance, similar to like an LOD. Imagine if an LOD didn't load in when you walked up to it. Things might look a bit weird. That's what's happening here. And we'll talk more about that in terms of MIPS later on. So a note on texture streaming is that, well, MIPS, again, we will talk more in depth about this. So please take what I'm about to say as if this is what you understand at this point, good enough. MIPS are simply akin to LODs for textures. Yes, they do more than that. And yes, it's more nuanced than that. We'll come back to that later on. So please, please don't kill me in the comments below for my simplification there. Now, DirectX 11 limits the number of texture samples a material can use. So if you remember with our water, we had a texture sample 
for our normals before we added the tessellation in. We we still have it, it's just now being blended into something else. We had a texture sample or multiple for how we controlled the movement of the wave crest, that sort of white light, if you looked at the texture samples, moving across the texture. So in DirectX 11, we are limited to a certain number of material can use. If for the texture sample is not being shared across the renderer, the limit is 16 texture samples. If, however, the texture is being shared, either via uh, wrap or clamp, then the renderer can handle up to 128 texture samples. For our landscape, this is the number of samples per component. I'm gonna rant about this now as well. I do rant about it in the video. If for some reason you're getting a glitch on your landscape where you put a third material into a component and it suddenly goes black or checkerboard or see-through, then go back and check if your texture samples are being shared or not. Doesn't matter which version, just need to be shared. Again, I will rant about this in the video proper. Now, we can, as a way of addressing some of this, and we'll come back to this point later, also we will actually do this in a later video, we can up the texture streaming pool. The default size is only about a gigabyte. And remember, the second a single pixel of a material is rendered in at runtime, the entire material and all of its component parts, so textures and what have you, are loaded into memory as well. So let's say we have a house, and the house has four texture samples, one for the roof, one for the windows, one for the frame, doors, window frames, what have you, and one for the walls. Let's say this building is being occluded by a large object to the point that we can only see the roof. We can only see one of the textures. Well, all four textures are loaded into memory. The entire material has been rendered, even though we can only see one part of it. So bear that in mind that that will impact on cost. So we can optimize our textures. I've already mentioned one, but we'll come back to that one in a moment. So what are our options? Well, we can use a fairly standardized, in terms of industry use, approach. And that is to optimize texture sizes down. So that way, when there are a lot of assets in the game, the stream textures are only as big as they need to be in order to be seen properly. So let's say a studio is making a game and for their game, they are targeting the use of 4K displays. Well, that studio might follow the 256 pixels per meter rule. So this rule applies to stuff that is immediately in the player's view and or in their face. So an example of this is if a player looks down at the ground, and again, we're playing on a 4K display here, then 256 pixels per meter will have enough pixels, or that texture will have enough pixels to have a crisp and clear image. Any smaller, then the image gets blurry when the player is up close to it. Now this raises two points. Farther away, come to that one later on, or ones that we're targeting a smaller display, like a 2K or 1440p display. Well, in which case, we're half our 4K display, we can half the pixel size. So whatever your target sort of output is, can just will dictate how many pixels per meter you'll need. We can do further optimization that kind of builds on this, in that we can use MIPS. And again, we will get into MIPS in more detail later on, but right now it can help with the image size issues because it can quickly resize a texture. But we should not rely on MIP mapping as the only method we use to optimize our textures. Now, we should start by following the rule on the previous slide. If we limit our texture size based on how big the asset is versus how it's UV mapped, we can create smaller, in terms of space on the drive, games that leave more room in our texture streaming budget, so smaller in our memory as well, and run faster. Now please note, I do violate this rule 
in selecting our textures. And that's just because, hey, these are free textures. I'm not an artist. So we, we got what we have to work with. Yes, that grammar was awful, I realize. Perhaps the artists out there would like to make their own textures or know better sources to get more optimized textures for what we're doing. Go ahead and feel free to use those. Now, in the, in the paragraph up there, that second bullet point, I talk about how big the asset is versus uh, the UV mapping, other things. I'm going to come to this because this is a particular rule in just a moment. And there are going to be links in the description below. So continuing on, as I've already kind of pointed out, I've only talked about when objects are up close. So what happens when it's off in the distance or we can't get right up next to it? Well, simply, you can have the texture size based on the distance to the camera. Now, I could not find a specific rule of thumb or a metric for this system. This literally just came as advice from an industry professional who helped me do the last couple of slides in terms of the content. And can I ever use a 4K texture? Sure, if you're doing a tutorial and it's free uh, and you're using free textures, yeah. Or, you know, you can in general, but hey, it might violate some rules. It might not be standard. It might have some other factors you need to consider, like, you know, how's it going to run on certain machines? But a 4K texture, according to the professionals I talked to, should only be used in one of two situations. First, when the asset takes up the entire screen during gameplay. And to be fair, for our island, I could make that argument. I probably should have gone for a lower resolution texture. In fact, the professionals I talked to who looked at it said I could have gone for a lower resolution. And or two... The asset is so large that it makes sense based on the texel density rule. Now, this is the rule that I was talking about on the last slide and the one I said there'd be links to in the description. Yes, I could walk you through the maths, but I don't, and I understand the maths, but I don't work in art. I don't work in materials. I don't, I don't work in materials. I don't work in textures. I can walk you through the math, but I would be the worst person probably to go to for use case examples. I would recommend talking to the artist in the Discord community we have and getting their points of view. All right, this has been a fairly long prep video at 13 minutes already, and I realize I'll be cutting some stuff out, but short version, you don't need to use 4K texture files unless there's a good reason to do so. If you're aiming to have your game run nicely and look good on a 4K screen, you can use a 256 pixels per meter rule. So in other words, a two by two meter square needs a 512 by 512 texture to look great. And again, please look at the links in the description. The images that are used in some of them are superb for understanding the textile density rule. Likewise, there are images on the community discord in the in progress sec section, check the pin messages that explain this rule. So yeah, come check out the articles, come to the community and check out what people have to say from, from industry points of view, get this information from the source. And as one of the industry professionals put it to me when I asked if you could have them know one thing as newbies to materials and textures, what's the one thing you want them to know? And they said, don't make them too expensive. All right, that takes us through everything we need to discuss for today's prep video. This video and this series have been brought to you by my Patreon sponsors like Hanas, Galois, One Vault 10, Connor, and Rian. I look forward to seeing you in the tutorial proper. And if you've not already, make sure to hit that like button down below. It lets me know I'm bringing you content you enjoy and appreciate. And if you want to be here when we work on our other layers and do our other prep videos, make sure to hit the subscribe and notify icon. All right. Now, I look forward to seeing you in the main tutorial. And I hope that you have a wonderful day.